Hey, welcome to the Church Explain podcast, a conversation to grow your leadership and build your church. I'm Dave, and I'm one of the hosts of the podcast. Normally, I'm joined by Nathan Benger, but he's at the moment sunning himself in Spain. It's his anniversary, so he tells me, so he's not around today. But it's exciting to have Mal Fletcher with us today on the show. Welcome, Mal. Great to have you here. Thank you, Dave. Good to be here. Fantastic. Let me just uh, share with our audience a little bit about you um, so people get a bit of a flavour of who you are. And it's hard to encapsulate just in a sentence or two uh, someone's life. So hopefully as we get into the podcast, Mal, you'll be able to share a little bit more about you, your background and your faith journey and anything that's maybe relevant to this podcast today. But let me just share a little bit about you. Mal Fletcher is the chairman of 2030 Plus a London-based futures forum focused on future shifts and leadership innovation, helping businesses, communities, and individuals deal proactively with change. Mal is also a social commentator, keynote speaker, author, and podcaster and broadcaster as well. So, hey, Mal, great to have you here with us today, and hopefully we can just dig in a little bit about some of the future stuff and stuff around the church as well. Well, I think a lot of our listeners will be just interested in your take on what does the future of the church look like? So welcome today. Thank you again, Dave. Brilliant. So, Mal, I wonder if we could just kick in a little bit about you, maybe just find out a little bit about your faith journey, your your background, uh, and maybe even a little bit of, about your family, your, some personal stuff there if you're happy to share. Sure, absolutely. Uh, as you get older, of course, it gets harder to put your life into a few words, but I'll do my best. Yeah. Um, I was born in Melbourne, Australia. I still have the accent, though I've lived in the European region for 30 years now. And uh, my father was working class, uh, as was my mum. They were hardworking people who loved God. They were yeah. the most committed members of their local church all the time I was growing up. And it was often commented on at the time so I had a great heritage um, but of course with heritage comes some baggage and my baggage just happens to be religious uh, baggage at times and um, my parents raised me to be very community focused for which I'm extremely grateful now uh, I studied architecture at university then went from that to study theology and apologetics for a time uh, alongside of the latter, I was doing youth ministry in our church at a time when there were only, I think, four or five accredited youth ministers in the charismatic Pentecostal church in Australia. So it was a rarity. Yeah, yeah. And uh, But my family, is there was a, a great sense of the love of God, the love of life, uh, good fun. There were seven kids in a house that probably really was only built for four and a half kids. <laughs> But, you know, we had a wonderful upbringing and we're so grateful for that. Yeah, it's good to find out a little bit about that. And, and, and for you then, where are you located now? Are you based in London? I'm based just outside of Oxford is where we live, uh, okay. but still travel extensively in various parts of the world. Was involved in the 1980s as the first national director of a movement called Youth Alive Australia. And this oh, thing wow, grew yeah. from around 300 young people in our city of Melbourne to over 60 to 80,000, conservatively speaking, in the next 10 to 12 years. And mm -hmm. it's still going forward today. It's just really reaching out to young people with the gospel in a way that they could relate to without, yeah. and this was a conscious effort, without uh, compromising the message, mm. the core message of the gospel. So from that went to Europe. Uh, started youth events, leadership networks across 15 nations in wow. Europe, based in Denmark. And then uh, about uh, 10 years ago, no, sorry, 20 years ago now, moved to the UK, predominantly because I felt a call to uh, secular media and to influencing in some way civic leadership and perhaps politics behind the scenes. Mm. And uh, maybe we'll dig into some of that as we go through the podcast today. So, Mal, just tell us a little bit about you, what you do for fun. Well, speaking to people like you is always fun, especially with that accent you have. Yeah. Beautiful Belfast Thank accent. You. 
<laughs> I uh, well, I'm pretty simple to please when it comes to fun because I, I travel a lot. I have done for forty years around the world. Wow. I just like being at home, um, reading. Do a lot of reading. I uh, play piano. I was a singer songwriter before I was a preacher, so I still occasionally dabble in that. Not in public. Wow. I must hasten to add. Okay. <laughs> but uh, occasionally I'll write a yeah. song for my own benefit or my grandkids or something. Um, and yeah, I, I, driving around, spending time with my wife, Davina, uh, no extreme sports in there. Okay. <laughs> no, no jumping off buildings or anything like that then. So just uh, taking, taking it easy. <laughs> never been tempted. Never been tempted. I've been tempted a few times actually just to do some abseiling or some other stuff or, you know, hand gliding. I quite fancy that actually, but um, you know, you never know. I might do it at some point in my life. So, hey, well, just as I say, great to have you here. Great to find out a little bit about you as a person. Um, I thought it'd be good for us just to begin to talk around some of the stuff that you're exploring and some of the stuff you're working on. Thinking especially around the 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 idea of AI at the minute, it's very popular. It's really come to the forefront. And I guess trying to work out, like, you know, where, what should leaders do with this? So whether in a church context or outside the church context, I mean, AI is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. If anything, it's going to continue to progress. So what do you think leaders and churches, um, for your research and experience, what should they do with this? How should they respond? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Dave. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about that. We're, we're actually at the moment running webinars for church leaders on this subject, going into all the research that we've been dealing with over the last few years. And uh, we're getting good response from d different parts of the world, and we're grateful for that. People can find out about that at 2030plus.com. But the, the key thing I want to say here is that you, when you start discussing AI, people get quite... Um, either excited or paranoid and upset mm. uh, in equal measure. And it's important to define a few things before you go into what the pros and cons might be. I mean, when we talk about artificial intelligence, the word intelligence there is used in a value neutral way. There's no reference there to what is good or bad. We're talking about mm. essentially mathematical calculations based on programming and data. So machines are making a moral uh, not even really choices, but a, a moral directions they're choosing. And we, as moral agents, are the ones who decide whether that's used for good or something less than good. Also, the word art, artificial is interesting because it's drawn from the word artifice, which means mask. Okay. AI might wear the mask of something that looks like human intelligence, but looks can be deceptive. AI is more about, uh, we call it single focus intelligence. So... If you, Dave, try to play a game of chess against an AI machine, you'll probably lose every time. Some people win, but not many, um, because that's very good at complex single focus tasks. It's not so good yet anyway at multi multiple focus tasks, uh, doing them simultaneously in the way that the brain does every day. So right now, at least, AI falls well short of what we call artificial general intelligence, mm -hmm. which is where a machine in theory could perform any task that you and I could do. So it's very important that we say that up front. Um, much will depend here on what we decide as human agents to do with AI. And I'm one in the public square calling for a moratorium on some developments so that we can get in place a, a guidelines, ethical guidelines for the use of AI in the same way we did for the use of genetic research back in 2015. We need the same yeah. sort of agreements and regulations in place. So that's the place I start when it comes to talking to church leaders. Yeah, and a good place to start. And if you think of AGI then, wh wh how far do you think that is off? Uh, on, you know, the sort of general intelligence, the artificial general intelligence. Do you think it's, is it something that is going to happen? Or is it just an idea? Well, to be honest, Dave, the school is still out on that one. Um, partly because we don't yet understand how the human brain works. And it will take us a very long time from now to map oh, yeah. the full neurology of our brains. So in trying to emulate the capacity of our brains, if that's what we're doing with AGI, 
uh, it will take a while for us to build some sort of model based in the human creature. That said, though, we already have aspects of machine learning we call machine learning, which mm. is where a machine doesn't require a programmer to uh, program it to do a certain task, like drive a car. It watches a human being do it and learns by mapping the data of the human being's uh, activity, mm. inferring from that data rules for, for behavior, for certain kinds of behavior. So it teaches itself it changes its own programming as a result. We call that deep learning partly because technologists, when they're honest, will tell you that they don't really understand how it happens. They just know that it does. Okay. So there are areas, obviously, for concern when it comes yeah. to AI. But how close we are to general intelligence, I think the school's still out on that one. Okay, so it could still be a little bit in the future. I mean, there's a lot of talks still out there at the moment around that topic as well. Some think it's going to be quite imminent. <laughs> Others maybe think it's a little bit still in the future. So, so thinking of AI and how you've described it, what are the wins, do you think, for us as a civilization? And what are the wins for us as the church or as church leaders? I guess, and what are the challenges you think we'll face? You know, that's a great question. It's probably a three-hour question, to be honest. Uh, but, but it's, it's <laughs> well, wonderful to have the opportunity. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think if we look at society-wide, uh, globally even, um, AI could be very helpful in helping us find solutions to our environmental challenges. Um, it could build and can now build predictive models for things like maximum air damage to tell us at what days of the week and a particular month might be the worst for air pollution, so that on those days in future we might choose to limit traffic or limit industrial output on those days. Um, it could be very helpful in manufacturing, improving the control of robotic machines, which are already in place in so-called mm. smart factories, enhancing the efficiency of those machines, checking their decisions to make sure they make good ones before they have, we, we face terrible consequences. Um, AI in healthcare. Already, AI is as good as or better than human doctors, according to some studies, in diagnosing certain forms of cancer, okay. simply because of the sheer amount of data AI can, can process. So there are some positives. For the church, I think there are positives there too. Um, possibilities with things like textual translation. Okay. AI can help us translate the Bible and all kinds of texts into very obscure languages through data mining mm. of language patterns. That's what GPT is built on. Mm. They're called large language patterns or models because they are trained using a whole lot of language-based data. So that could be very helpful in the translation of texts. Um, it could help us in analyzing connection points for the gospel in a culture. What are the questions that people are asking? Um, what are the, the points where we're most likely to be met with a receptive hearing when it comes to mm. the good news? Simultaneous translation of spoken word. You know, it's already happening in some big conferences around the world. Even in rare dialects, AI can translate simultaneously what someone is saying into a foreign language without any human intervention. Wow. which is remarkable. Yeah, um, one of the things I love, and I've been talking about this for a few years now, is the opportunity for us as Christians to write position papers on major social problems, calling on the writings of great Christian figures in the past and present. So mm -hmm. it could collect all the thoughts of, you know, you name them, C.S. Lewis, uh, Tolkien, uh, go further back, St. Augustine and so on, translate them into modern language on a particular subject, and then publish them in many forms at once. So by video, mm. audio, text, music, <laughs> all at once. And that could be hugely helpful to us in interacting with a society and trying to present the kingdom of God in that apologetic of modern issues. There's leadership training. There's all sorts of other things that it can help us with. But I think AI is not necessarily bad news for the church. So, yeah, some, some great opportunities there, um, as you've described, some things that we can use to work out what's happening in our communities or cities or towns, or, you know, so we can present the message in an effective way, is what you're saying there. 
what are the what are the challenges though? Do you think there are any challenges, or is it just an upside when it comes to AI? No, there there are plenty of challenges, um, and that, again, would take a long time to do to deal with it properly. But I think one of the most obvious ones is jobs, and church leaders are very interested in this. Um, yeah. One study commissioned by the House of Lords in London found a few years ago that in the next what is now fifteen years something like 35% of British jobs could be automated. Wow. In Australia, it's more like 45% of jobs in the same time frame. Yeah. So unemployment and underemployment are already affecting people in areas like manufacturing, but also in professions. Okay. You know, we're seeing lawyers now complaining that yeah. robots and, and AI chatbots are taking over certain areas. Yeah. Um, through history, New techs have always brought new forms of jobs, but the challenge now, Dave, is whether we can transition quickly enough to take advantage of entirely new careers before mm. the machines get to them. Because um, it's, it's the speed of learning, isn't it, at the minute, with the AI stuff? Yeah, exactly. It's the, it's the, and that, it's the sort of almost exponential growth in what AI mm. can do. And it's, so it's very hard to give definitive predictions about where AI, AI will be in about five years, which is why some technologists are, I think rightly, very concerned and very watchful. I mean, there's AI in the cashless economy. Mm. Um, AI will put us even more at the mercy of automated systems. And I've been saying in the media for a long time, cash may be messy, but it has weight. You can feel it leaving your pocket. And the big problem with digital uh, cash, digital currency, is that people spend more with less forethought. Mm. And AI might move us, will move us more in, in that direction. Um, so there are some great benefits. False representation is a big one for church leaders. Imagine the damage AI could do to a pastor's professional reputation or even personal life as it mm. becomes more and more skilled at producing fake videos, deep fake videos. Yeah. You know, church leaders could be accused of all kinds of misbehavior, even crimes, and then yeah. very quickly tried online in the court of public opinion. Um, and look, can I just say this? One of the things AI can't do, and this should encourage pastors and Christians generally, AI can't empathize. Mm. Empathy is the one characteristic of human activity that I think machines will never master. It can fake empathy yeah. by reading your visual signals of your face and so on, but it can't show the real thing because it has no shared human experience. And so uh, jobs that are empathic in their nature or therapeutic in their nature, I think need to play up that side mm. of their work so that we safeguard them and pastoring is one of those ministry is one of those we need to play up the empathic side the therapeutic rather than purely scientific side of what we're doing so that we have a little more chance about living the machine yeah that's a very good point there it's that empathy that human touch i guess that uh, people will still always be looking for or, i mean it is interesting to think that, that ai is used and that's lots of even softer type jobs like whether it's therapy or even coaching you know i mean I, i'm involved in leadership coaching but of course people go online now they can they can put some information in and they they can get good answers or good challenging questions back just from ai itself so it isn't interesting that some of those softer skills whether coaching or therapy um ai can help but it still misses i guess the human touch where um that's where leaders and pastors into their strength, I guess, because that's never going to go away. Yeah, it's one of the things I, I was speaking about this on, I think it was GB News or something the other day, with the, the, the railways closing off all human ticketing booths. Mm. Um, one of the things we should have learned from COVID is simply that a lack of human interaction is not good for mental health. Mm. In the age of high tech, we need more high touch, not less. A growing engagement with technology means we need more engagement with humanity for our own mental health sake. Uh, and I think, as we say with ministers and pastors, the good news is that if we can emphasize that empathic side, not just in counseling, but even in our preaching and teaching and so on. I was a pastor once a long time ago. Um, I'm still an accredited minister, by the way. I'm still yeah. ordained. But 
as a minister, there is a, a, a an empathic side to everything we do. Even the public proclamation involves a certain degree of listening to what's happening around us. And that will, I think, become more and more important mm. as AI kicks in. So that that's a great win, really, for churches and leaders to be thinking of that. So rather than, I guess, working against AI, like what, what can we do to enhance the thing that we have rather than um, setting it aside? I, I, I've been thinking a little, a little bit around this idea of the individual as well. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there around how do we enhance ourselves like whether it's biohacking you know people want to improve their skills or their abilities what's your thoughts on stuff like that because you know people will use technology they will use other things to improve their lives do you think there's do you think there's a, a line that we shouldn't cross yeah, I think there is. Uh, I, I need to preface it by saying I'm not by nature or theology a Luddite. I'm not yeah. someone who's averse to change. I think the Christians in history have often been at the forefront of adopting new tools, new technologies. Printing press is just one of hundreds yeah. of examples I could give you. Um, so I think that there's something in the book of Genesis that leads to, you know, this idea of subduing the earth filling it and having dominion over it, taking all the the natural benefits of creation, the natural potential of creation, combining that with our God-given human ingenuity to subdue the earth, to have dominion yeah. in a stewardship way, a loving stewardship of the earth. So right from the beginning, I think, we see this idea that Christians are to engage. Um, my dear friend Joel Edwards, Dr. Joel Edwards, who passed away a couple of years ago, was for 20 years the head of the EA here in the UK. He, he used to say this, if you want to shape the culture, you must engage the cultural conversation with curiosity. Great. And it's that curiosity factor that is often missing, uh, or from time to time missing in what we do as Christians. We need to be curious about the tick, to find out how it ticks, what its potential positives are, and then redeem aspects of it, you know, so that it, it can be glorifying to God, at least in those aspects. To answer the specific thing on things like biohacking, which you've suggested, um, in the 19th century, we invited tech into our workspaces through factories and so on. In the 20th century, we invited it more increasingly into our homes and private lives through domestic gadgets and even the mm. internet eventually. But this century, we seem to be moving increasingly toward inviting tech into our bodies. So we have wearables, you know, at yeah. the moment. We have um, high-tech prosthetics produced by holographic projection. We have brain implants mm. on the cards. Elon Musk wants to start human trials this year yeah. for Neuralink to insert yeah. chips into human brains, potentially to stave off memory loss, recovery of sights uh, might result as well. All of that's good. But it does raise questions, and this is where you're coming from, three questions in particular that we're going to need to keep asking and trying to, to answer. The first one is, how do we feel about our bodies becoming hackable and trackable devices? Mm. I've got a smartphone, you've got a smartphone. They're hackable, by definition, any computer device is, and they're trackable. So a chip inserted under the skin or in, in some other part of the body suffers from that same potentiality. That's right. At least you can put your smartphone in the drawer and leave it at home. You can't do that with a chip embedded into the body. So that's a question. Second one is what happened to the line between human and machine? How do we know where humanity ends and technology begins? Does that line even matter anymore? That's a big question. And for a Christian, that has to be based in our, our theology, doesn't it? And here's the final one. The third question we ask in the face of these things is, how far are we willing to go uh, to pursue ultra pragmatism? Mm. Now, I've got no problem with pragmatism. The Bible actually doesn't have a problem with pragmatism because Jesus actually used the word pragmatizeo mm. when he said to the, in the parable of the talents, he's, the master says to the servants, make a profit till I come. That word profit is pragmatizeo. Mm. So God wants us to get results. But ultra pragmatism, says if a thing can be done, it should be done. And in technological terms, that history shows this, opens a, 
an entire Pandora's box of all kinds of horrors. Um, we need to think about what we do before we do it, especially with these powerful texts that we're talking about today. So I have no problem with people uh, inserting, you know, having inserted um, machine-like entities into problem areas of the body. Essentially, we've been doing something like that for decades now with other forms of surgery. Right. Um, you could argue that a hip replacement, for example, is like that. The difference here is that it's electronic um, and it could be wired to the cloud, which can mean that there's some danger that you will be hacked. All these things need to be worked through. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a big challenge. It's that hackable and trackable. I think people need to think through a lot when it comes to any of the tech stuff. I, I guess in my mind, I'm almost envisioning where lots of these things start off as help to the human body. So it could be like someone suffering from, you know, mental, you know, you know like a, a loss of memory. So they put a chip in, but it gets to a point where it becomes more than that, doesn't it? Where it becomes available to the, the wider population. People begin to use it. And actually, so rather than just helping with memory loss, it enhances their memory from what they have. I think, I think that's one of the the key things that, that could be possible even in the sort of di the near distant future, not too far away. So I, I'm trying to, I guess, wrestle with that a little bit. Part of me, if I'm honest, thinks I actually I quite like that idea of having something to help me be better. But it, it comes to those fundamental questions, doesn't it, about hackable and trackable. So as Christians, like we have to think, well, you know, where 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 is the line? Because sometimes the line starts here and we're okay with it. And then suddenly, you know, it's for health reasons. Then suddenly the line shifts. Okay, it's for improvement reasons. And then the line keeps moving. So, so what's your take on that? What, what, what should we do, do you think, as you're thinking of the future? What, what's your advice to leaders? Well, I think for Christian leaders and Christians in general, um, it really is not so much about the technology, but the ethics of its research and development and use. It comes back to that question of ethics. And of course, ethics uh, is a branch of philosophy that really essentially only asks two questions. One, what's the right thing to do? And how do I apply that in a given situation, particularly in a non-binary situation where there's no clear right and wrong? where there are shades of grey, as you say there are with issues relating to AI. Um, I think, though, our ethics then has to be based in a very sound, what I call theology of technology. Um, we've already seen this constantly, some Christians basing their theology on moral issues, on their experience or the experience of people they love, instead of the theology of Scripture. Mm. Our experience as Christians has to serve our theology, not the other way around. Mm. Um, and I think we need to see uh, church leaders equipped to present what I'm calling a theology of technology and Christians are aware of the truths of it. For example, there are a whole bunch of precepts that I've set out for theology of technology and I'm still adding to it all the time. They come straight from Scripture. There's nothing particularly okay. revelatory about them. It's the application that's important. And the first one is the thing I touched on earlier, that the development of tech is a fulfillment of God's first command in Genesis 1. Okay, um, so it's a but that, yeah, but that means, if that's true, if we're called call to use the raw materials of, of nature and our ingenuity to steward creation, we should focus on finding innovative, fresh ways to use tech. So we shouldn't be on the back foot, we should be on the front foot. Okay. But it also means we must remain in control, as you've suggested, control of the development of our tools, because I often say tech's a good servant. It's a very poor master. We need mm. to subdue it. Right. Another precept I think is very important. and Pastors will affirm this. Only humans reflect the special image of God. And that has to be absolutely central, central to our thinking about things like A.I., you know, Genesis 2 says that God breathed into us human beings the breath of life. No matter how sophisticated our AI becomes, it will always be, at its root, a human creation. But we, according to the scripture, are a divine creation. We're uniquely set apart. And God has breathed into, God hasn't rather breathed into tech this 
breath of life. And we have no power to breathe that yeah. special breath of life into machines. So AI might impress us, but we have to reserve the respect we have for human beings, for human beings, and reserve the reverence we have for God, for God. We shouldn't treat technology with that kind of re respect or reverence. Mm. So there's two precepts, and I could give you a bunch more, that I think should, would then drive our ethical standards. Our ethics have to be based in some sort of biblical theology. Yeah, I, I love that. I, I wonder if I could just push you a little bit further on that then, maybe if you could share maybe two or three more of those precepts that you've been thinking through, because those two that you've shared already are very helpful. The fact that God breathed into us, we're, you know, we're, we're made in the image of God. So that's not going to change. That That's that's the fundamental truth if we're a follower of Jesus, that's what we're believing. Well, what other useful precepts then would you be able to share with leaders today? Yeah, Dave, one of the, this is where we start actually, the webinars I mentioned before for pastors and leaders at 2030plus.com yeah. because this is the most important thing I think in all of it is that we understand how our theology and our kingdom worldview speaks to this issue of technology and its power. It's not as if it's not presaged in some way in yeah. scripture. I think I'll give you one more. The third one um, I would cite today is that the church should use tech more than for church related needs. Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's, everything in it, the world and all who live in it. I think I'm quoting oh, that correctly. Yeah. So the church isn't yeah. God's only inheritance. The entire world is rightfully his. And our lives should reflect that, including the way we use technology. So we need to be looking at ways of using technology to benefit community, to be benefit the city. Jeremiah 29, mm. seek the welfare of the city. Pray on its behalf or in seeking its welfare, you find your welfare. I often tell pastors, you know, it's not much of a way to live your life to get out of bed in the morning saying, I'm going to add another 50 people to my church this year. Mm. That's nice. But when you get to 45, 50, 55 years of age, you look back at your life and think, is that it? But if you get up in the morning and say, I'm here to seek the welfare of this city in Jesus name. And I'm here to help bring redemptive revelation to areas of the city and redig wells in my city. The, yeah. the wells of Abraham, as it were, the things that God has placed within that city, the, the strengths of industry and so on. How can I enhance that by building a church mm. in the process of building a church? So, our, you know, I'm not saying our first call isn't shepherding the people we've got. It is. But we should do it with an eye on the people who aren't yet there, but could be. Yeah. And so this idea of the earth being the Lord's and the city being important to God should drive out. Uh, approach to technology, particularly things like AI, because if we can adapt AI in godly ways, we can be an example of the city of how it can be used, how it, in a sense, can be sanctified, set apart. Yeah, yeah, I, I like that. So, so like any of the technology, not just in our time, but I, obviously in previous generations, it's our decision of how we're going to use that. Are we going to use it for good, or is it going to be used in some other way? Um, you've mentioned a few times the webinars you've been doing. Uh, you know, we'll we'll put uh, a link at the, in the show notes about those webinars because I think it'd be really interesting for leaders to get on those, uh, especially if they're interested in the subject of AI and technology and all those sort of things looking to the future. So we will drop that in into the show notes so people can find that. But how often are they happening for you then? How often are you running those at the minute? Well, the webinars have been set up so that they run automatically at certain times. Gotcha. And the benefit of that yeah, is yeah. we have people in the US, people in Europe, Australia, Asia, uh, South Africa, booking into them. And you can ask questions because there's a, a, a through mechanism whereby questions are asked, uh, asked and either at the time or slightly later answered. Yeah. But the great thing about it is a pastor can say, look, there are five or six or seven options on that particular date that I can do. This is the best time for me. Uh, I want to dive in at that time. And because they're 30 minutes maximum long, it means that uh, we're cramming an awful lot of truth into uh, that 20, 25 minute frame. And it means that leaders can go away and 
really mull over what they can even replay it if they wish to. You don't have to watch yes. it once. So it's better than a digital roundtable, which we've often run for church leaders. Yeah. This is slightly better because it allows the multiplicity of options. Different time zones, all that sort of stuff makes it easier and more accessible for people, I guess. Yeah. Mal, it's been so good to have you on the show with us today. We know that some of the stuff you've shared is really going to be helpful for listeners as they think about the future, as they think of technology or AI or ethics. It's good for them to be thinking through some of these big subjects and how they can be more strategic uh, as they look to proclaim the gospel in their setting. So, first of all, I want to say thank you for, for joining us today on the Church Explained podcast. Where else can people find you if they want to connect with you? I know you've got the website, 23plus.com, is that correct? 2032030, followed by the word oh, plus, yeah, yeah. P-L-U-S, 2030plus.com. Yeah. Yeah. But they can also get us yeah, on social media. If you go to my name, Mal, M-A-L, not E-L, M-A-L Fletcher, um, yeah. at, uh, in, in Twitter, Instagram, threads, uh TikTok, um, YouTube, it's, it's every day something is there, often multiple instances of, of stuff. Fantastic. So, so people can connect with you through all those different uh, social media platforms as yes. well. Great stuff. And of course, if people want to get on to some of your webinars, um, they can find that info on your website as well. We would encourage leaders to do that. That would be maybe a great help to them as they're thinking through some of these big ideas. Well, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for being on the Church Experience podcast. And we want to say to all our audience today that um, for them to you know rate, subscribe, wherever they listen to this content, just to let people know that we're here and encourage them to keep connecting in and keep coming back week by week.